Stay tuned for tonight's adventure with the Fat Man. Okay, here we go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever time of day it is, I hope it's good to be where you are because I'm really excited to be here today. My name is Baltimore Fats, and in this episode, the ring is the thing. Yeah! All right, have fun, guys. All right, so continuing our investigation into the people behind the monster and how they could factor in to all of this madness, it's time to get juicy with it by taking a look into Mary Shelley, nay Godwin's father, William, or the Juice, as I like to call him. Right? And I call him the Juice because the name Godwin, and I let this accidentally slip already, but the name Godwin is an abbreviation of Godwine. According to the House of Names, the surname Godwin was first found in Yorkshire, where they held a family seat from very early times. Does that sound familiar? Right, Godwin, or Godwine, was the Earl of Wessex. And so if wine is the nectar of God, then so too is this name. And though I could only trace his paternal line back a few generations, my fat senses are telling me that he believed himself to be a descendant of this Earl of Wessex. And it's here we can tighten up this story a little bit, connecting the juice, and therefore his daughter, to this story, and how the stories of the Vikings and the Anglo-Saxon tribes of Britain were possibly manufactured to pacify the locals after their land was taken over by the church and their foreign kings, using scriptoriums to spread this new history through their university system, and then later on presenting forged artifacts to support their story. And all of this is called from the mainstream narrative straight up. And there may be no better example of this deception in action than that of Godwine, the first Earl of Wessex. OJ, the original juice. And his story is so full of Anglo-Saxony Dark Ages goodness, it's almost as if it was cooked up in a lab. A lab like, say, the Polygon, perhaps? Because the Juice's story is so incredible that it begins with the ancestors of Godwine, the first Earl of Wessex. And wouldn't you know it, his ancestors were nothing but a pack of wolves. His father was called Wolfnoth Killed, or Sild. I'm not exactly sure on that one. But anyway, it stands for Child of the Wolf of the North or North Wolf Jr., right? And his grandfather, four or five times removed, was this Aethel Wolf, which means noble wolf. There are wolves crawling all over the story of the Anglo-Saxons. And it's enough to make me wonder if there could be anything more to the eternal wolf season that was happening later on in England, beyond the fact that they were savage woodland predators, because the noble wolf was the king of Wessex. In fact, OJ's entire family tree is littered with kings of Wessex, all the way back to the very first one, Sir Dick. Or maybe that's Curdick, I don't know. But regardless, historians tell us that this family holds the crown of Wessex for some 500 plus years. And the amazing thing about the kingdom of Wessex is that it, it includes a lot of Mud City favorites like Cornwall and Devon and Dorset and Somerset and Sussex and etc. and etc. And so after some 500 plus years of territorial beefs and, and fending off our dreaded Vikings, the kings of Wessex eventually unify enough of the Anglo-Saxon territories to create the first kingdom of England under King Athelstan. Right? And Athelstan means noble stone. Right? So we have more stone symbolism in there for you. Right? So we have the noble stone, we have the noble wolf, we have the woman from the wolf stone place. You know, is that just a coincidence? You tell me. And this new Anglo-Saxon kingdom of England is held in extant until Godwine's grandson, Harold II, gives it to William the Conqueror by getting himself killed at the Battle of Hastings. And so Mud City has it that the juice is connected to all of this, or certainly believes he was connected to all of this, which is really amazing because to this day, all the kings and queens of England and Britain trace their lineage back to the House of Wessex. So who knows how close to the royal bloodline the juice's blood runs. I don't know, but I certainly believe it's a lot closer than historians want us to know about the way his family tree just dead ends the way it does, right? Because we're just getting started. If all of the monarchs of England can trace their lineage back to the House of Wessex, then ostensibly we can connect the House of Wessex to this guy, Rollo, the first Duke of Normandy, whom Sterla Ellingvag tried to connect to Queen Elizabeth by analyzing DNA from known Rollo ancestors, the Duke's Richard. Right? And this little experiment turns out to be a bust, raising more questions than answers and launching a series right? that has led to the juice. 
And to further tighten the strings, all this Anglo-Saxon history, the House of Wessex, and all the other Anglo-Saxon noble houses is built around, all comes from a scant few sources. The two main sources for the history of Wessex are the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and the West Saxon Genealogical Regnal List, which sometimes conflict, because of course they do. And just to pick on one, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is allegedly a history of the Anglo-Saxons that was begun in the late 9th century and added to for the next 160 years or so. And only nine of these manuscripts survive in whole or in part. Seven of them in the British Library, one in the Bodleian Library at Oxford, and the other at the Parker Library of Corpus Christi College in Cambridge, which is where the Macmillans first set up their shop. Right? I'm sure that's just a coincidence. And here we have the name Parker again as well. I'm sure that's also more coincidence. But unfortunately, none of these nine manuscripts, in whole or fragment, are the original version. How convenient! All a good forger would have to do is make nine copies, not even, of a book like this. And voila! The world is sold on the Anglo-Saxon history of the British Isles. And this is a totally doable thing, as far as Mud City is concerned. Especially when some of the best physical evidence you can provide for your ancient Anglo-Saxon kings are things like this. And this is Aethelwulf's ring. Aethelwulf, of course, being OJ's great, 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 great grandfather. And so this is a ring allegedly made for him when he was reigning King of Wessex sometime in the mid 800s. Yeah, so over 1200 years ago, right? And it's one of two key examples of Neleo 9th century metalwork, right? So there aren't that many of these around to use for comparison. And these two rings represent the emergence of a court style of West Saxon metalwork, characterized by an unusual Christian iconography, such as a pair of peacocks at the Fountain of Life on the Aethelwolf ring. And so that's pretty incredible, right? So let's take a closer look at this ring. All right, so these are apparently peacocks, right? And this is the Fountain of Youth. Now, I had never heard that the peacock represented Christian immortality before, but sure enough, according to the Jesus Walk Bible Study series, Christians adopted the symbol of the peacock to represent immortality from an ancient legend that says the flesh of the peacock did not decay, right? And it is also associated with the resurrection of Christ because it sheds its old feathers every year and grows newer, brighter ones each year. If the peacock is portrayed drinking from a vase, it symbolizes a Christian drinking the waters of eternal life. In addition, the multitude of eyes upon its stunningly beautiful fantail suggested the all-seeing eye of God. And right, so I guess these represent the all-seeing eye of God on the peacock's tail feathers as it drinks from the fountain of life. And we're going to put all this immortality stuff in our back pocket for later, because the most interesting thing about this ring to me is all the quatrefoils on it. Right? We have two quatrefoils in the Fountain of Youth here, and there's one on the back. And it's this one on the back that brought my apophenia right to the church machines. And how the quatrefoil looks like a hydrogen wave function, right? and how some of these hydrogen wave functions resemble the somatic patterns of music, like these and how some of these somatic patterns resemble the big windows on churches, like this one that I featured in my How Sharp Is Your F video, where I correlate these somatics to their corresponding computer programming languages. And quite a few of these patterns have corresponding programming languages. It's not just the F sharp. And since it's been a while since we talked about the Mud City mythos, let's take a moment to do that, shall we? All right, and so Mud City casts these big churches as reality generators used by the Demiurge and his minions, the Archons, to create our reality. The Demiurge is an artisan-like figure responsible for fashioning and maintaining the physical universe. Praise Yaldabaoth! Right? And his minions, the Archons, could be color-coded or color-matched to where Yaldabaoth pulled them out of the Pleroma, or the white light. All right? And so these Archons would use these machines first to shape the realm, Think about how important hydrogen is to chemistry, right? It is the building block of matter, or so they tell us. And then later on, after the flood, they used them to pacify the survivors as they rebuilt and repopulated the realm. All right, so if the Tartarians have Tartaria and Archaics has the simulacrum or whatever bullshit that he's selling, I can have reality-shaping church machines, right? And Mud City reckons that the crown 
literally functions on the post-flood realm as the company put in charge of recovery and rebuilding, at least what we think of as the Western world anyway. And then the crown contracted out all the services a new growing realm would need with their creation of guilds or livery companies. And then, of course, all the learned societies, led by the king of such societies, the Royal Society, and its field marshals. And so Mud City paints much of our mainstream historical narrative as a cover story for this recovery project, that our presented history is a melange of fiction and masked, compressed, and homogenized allegory and metaphor to cover up this operation. Something like Conquest could be seen as a rescue mission through this prism, a prism I found trying to make the fake history cover-up of Flat Earth and the Mud Flood and what have you work within the context of this presented history. Could I effectively demonstrate that the faking of history and covering up of these and other conspiracies, in quotes, is not only possible, but probable, or even better, that all this fake history and related conspiracies, even the truth movement itself, was nothing more than misdirection and distraction. That was the goal when I started this show. And so when evidence like Aethelwolf's ring is propped up, I believe it bolsters the fake history argument because of the absolutely incredible story of the finding of Aethelwolf's ring. A story that I'm sure inspired Tolkien a little bit if he didn't write this story himself. And so this ring, smithied into existence for King Aethelwolf sometime around 850 AD or so, at some point is somehow dropped on an ancient road in Wiltshire, where it was found in a cart rut in Laverstock in about August of 1780. Laverstock was apparently a stronghold for the kings of Wessex, where they held the ancient settlement of Old Sarum, an ancient hilltop settlement dating back however far they wanted to. And Old Sarum is conveniently located not all that far from Stonehenge and Avebury, which are in Wiltshire as well. And Wiltshire is also the place where all the craziness surrounding pervy Mervyn Touche happened. All of this can be no coincidence if the juice connects himself to Wiltshire through the House of Wessex. So maybe he does fit in with this story as well. The way he seems to be involved in the creation of the fragile fractals and this whole identity politics storyline. But more on that later, because we're not done with the incredible story of Aethelwolf's ring, which, as I said, was miraculously found in a cart rut in Laverstock. And believe me, I could go on all day about Wiltshire, Laverstock, and Salisbury, which is also a part of Wiltshire. But after an alleged thousand plus years in the dirt, this ring is fished out of the rut in 1780 by one William Petty, who sells it to a local silversmith in Salisbury. And this silversmith, in turn, sells it to the Earl of Radnor, who is one Jacob Platel Bouvier, second Earl of Radnor, who was styled the Viscount Folkestone, right? So more stone symbolism in there for you, right? And he was a fellow of both the Royal Society and the Society of Antiquaries, who will have their moment in the sun later on. But can you imagine the sense of dumb luck the Viscount Folkestone must have felt finding this ring in his local silversmith shop? How lucky can one fellow be, right? And surely this is exactly as the finding of this ring went down, especially when it was found by someone as trustworthy as William Petty. And so now I don't know who this guy is, but if this name sounds familiar to you, it should, because William Petty is the name of the Marquis of Lansdowne. Are you kidding me, right? With the part that Lansdowne is playing in all of this, whether it's this guy here as prime minister at the end of the American Revolution, or it's the battlefield where Sir Bevel is mortally wounded, or Lansdowne Place, which is across the street from the Polygon? How is it that the name of the man who finds this ring is the same as the Marquis of Lansdowne? What are the odds of that, right? And surely the Marquis here knew the Earl of Radnor. And while I could find nothing that puts the Marquis in Wiltshire in 1780, that doesn't mean he wasn't there, or that this isn't some cousin or nephew or uncle of his. You know, I don't know. But this story just keeps getting crazier and crazier. And so in Mud City's eyes, this ring is nothing more than an 18th century forgery slipped into the narrative by the Earl of Radnor to support the false Anglo-Saxon story. And so to bring this thing full circle, the idea of the Anglo-Saxons in the Viking story being manufactured gets another boost from the unlikeliest of sources, our dear old friend Alex Wolfe author of History Today's hit piece on the Vikings, right? And now his name takes on a whole new meaning 
in light of how lupine this whole Anglo-Saxon story is. So Mr. Wolf here, in his attempt to dismiss the preconceived notions of what a Viking was, uses this person as an example. Characterizing a ruler like Canute as a Viking is nonsensical. He attended the imperial coronation of Conrad II in Rome in 1027 and founded and endowed churches across both his English and Danish realms. And so who he's talking about here is Canute the Great. And Canute was king of something called the North Sea Empire, which consisted of England, Norway, Denmark, and parts of Sweden. And I love that his banner is a raven, right? And so ruling over such a kingdom, historians have labeled Canute as a Viking king. But our boy Wolfie says not so fast when he says characterizing Canute as a Viking is nonsensical because Canute was a diplomat, right? And he was a philanthropist. By trying to distinguish Canute, the noble king, from the marauding pirates that give the Vikings their name, Wolfie forgets two important things when choosing Canute as a noble example for why there was never such a thing as a Viking. The first being is that Canute was a cold-blooded killer. Canute was the head of an array of Vikings from all over Scandinavia. Right? The invasion force was to engage in often close and grisly warfare with the English for the next 14 months. That sounds an awful lot like Viking behavior to me. And the other thing that he misses, or maybe even fails to consider at all in making this statement, is that by focusing on Canute's diplomacy over his savagery, to dismiss the Viking label, he glosses over the whole point of eliminating the Vikings. It's not about whether or not the Vikings were savage pirates. That's literally where the word comes from. But rather, it's about their ethnicity, whether they were blonde-haired and blue-eyed. It's about tearing down the ideology of these idiots, right? By eliminating this guy genetically, thus eliminating whatever misguided understanding these idiots have about race in their ideologies. You know, Wolfie ignores this element altogether with this statement. What does how diplomatic Canute was have to do with whether or not there was actually a blonde-haired, blue-eyed progenitor race for what we call the Vikings today? And if there was such a race, surely those people would be the kings, right? And this is where Canute the Great betrays Wolfie because just about, because just about every contemporary image that I could find of Canute suggests that he was a blondie. Perhaps Canute was not the best example that Wolfie could have named, but I'm glad that he did, because of course I read about Canute back when I first started looking into all of this, but that left me unprepared for what comes next. You see, Canute, as mentioned, won his kingdom in England after over a year of bloody conflict, and he took that crown from the King of Wessex, Edmund Ironside. But Canute, being king of the North Sea Empire, doesn't actually rule from England. He rules from his home turf of Denmark. And so what he does is he quarters off his British holdings and puts earls in charge to act as stewards, setting up our boy OJ as the first Earl of Wessex. Which again brings us right back to the idea of all of this history being manufactured and how it can relate to the story of the Fragile Fractals. Because I can tie, because I can tie the story of the Fragile Fractals to the elimination of the Vikings, right, to the Viking takeover of England, and Aethelwolf's ring to the juice and to whatever the hell was going on at the Polygon, right? Because Mud City speculates that these stories could be of a more modern vintage, one possibly set up by the god of wine himself, right? The juice. All right, so I'm going to wrap this one up here. When we come back, there should be nothing that gets in the way of my dance with the juice. So stay tuned for the next ring bearing episode. Remember, guys, just because you don't know the truth, doesn't mean you can't have fun with the lies. Until the next one, cheers.